in. Whew. All right. Come on, Zoom now. I heard, right. good, I heard good things about you. Don't disappoint me. <laughs> <laughs> there it says, it says it's now streaming live on Facebook. Okay. All right. So we're, we're streaming live again. All right. Okay, let's do it. So, okay. So we're going to try this. You know that they said the second time is a charm. So if everyone who lost us, um, I do apologize. Okay, let me do the right thing. Hello, this is Kitty London, host and creator of the People of Power Show. I think maybe because I didn't do that. <laughs> and every week I sit down with um, movers and shakers, CEOs, entrepreneurs, people who are doing amazing things. And today, um, for the second time around, I am sitting with state attorney, uh, Dave Ehrenberg, and we are practicing social distancing. So we are sitting here in our own homes uh, doing this. I love technology. Um, last time I said I saw you, you were on MSNBC doing big things. Very proud of you. You know, we always root for our home team when they are on uh, national uh, syndicated news shows, but you're on People with Power today. So I thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be back on with you, Kitty. This is our second time, and it won't be our last. Yes. Yeah, so as, as long as you'll have me back. Oh, of course. Yes. Okay. Right. I do apologize <laughs> um, because, again, the, you know, this technology is great. Uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. So if I don't get to any questions, I do apologize. I do have a set of questions that I already um, wanted to ask because, again, and it, it really is covering um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So the first question, again, I was asking was, you know, I hold up these essential items that we are now, well, they're saying we need now, which is hand sanitizers and face masks. And I think because a lot of people are, are scared, they're, you know, they're nervous about what's going on. You know, we don't always think with our, uh, the best senses, we go out and we buy these items and we don't realize maybe we are being taken advantage of, maybe we're not because we really don't know, you know, unless you're in the healthcare industry, you don't know how much a face mask is supposed to cost. So, you know, we hear about price gouging. So I wanted you to, you know, talk a little bit about that. And if we do feel that we are being um, taken advantage of, what options do we have? Price gouging, Kitty, is when a price of an essential commodity is in gross excess of the average price before the state of emergency. So first, you have to have a state of emergency, which we do. Second, you have to have an essential commodity such as toilet paper, hand sanitizer, or masks. And then third, you've got to compare the current price to the previous price before the state of emergency. And we take the average of the price of the previous 30 days before the state of emergency, and you compare the two prices. And if the current price is in gross excess of the previous price, then it's price gouging. Now, the problem is that the sanction for price gouging in Florida is pretty weak. It's $1,000 per incident. So there's no handcuffs, no jail time. But you can get a fine that could get hefty depending on how many cases you can prove. But the attorney general is the one who leads the enforcement of it. And the AG has a special toll-free hotline for price gouging. 1-866-9-NO-SCAM. 1-866-9-NO-SCAM. One eight six six nine no scam they also have a website where you can report it online and an app where you can report it through your phone all right great now you know you've been doing this a long time when you have that number memorized that's a little scary <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, let's I, just... it, you know what i i really this is i detest price gouging because we're all in this together and instead of neighbor helping neighbor you have some people who see this as an opportunity to take advantage of people to make money off of everyone else's anxiety and, and desperation. And to me, that is so gross that it deserves a punishment, even though it's just $1,000 per violation. If we can prove enough cases, then it could be significant. Ironically, if you sell an item without a business license, that's a crime. That's actually a misdemeanor. But price gouging is, is just a fine. Okay. Well, I'm glad you clarified that. Now, we know that Sunday is the biggest church day pretty much of the year. Um, you know, there's always that little underlying joke that people will go to church on, on an Easter Sunday when they won't go anywhere. And right now, you know, we are forced uh, with basically virtual church um, if you're doing the right thing. For people who may feel like, you know what, 
I am just going to go with what I know and the Lord is going to be my savior and we're going to still have church. We're going to have 300 house full Sunday and we're just going to do what we have to do because guess what? I answer to the Lord. You know, I'm being, I'm acting right now, but you have people that feel that way. They don't care about the pandemic. They don't care about COVID-19. Um, it is what it is. And it's, you know, the right of religion or free of, you know, free freedom of religion. And they feel like they're just going to do what they have to do. Will those people or can those people face consequences for not social distancing on yeah. those occasions? Well, the Bible says, love thy neighbor. Don't put your neighbor at risk, right? I mean, and people are putting their thy neighbor at risk when they go to church in a large gathering near each other, and then they could contract the virus. They could spread it themselves. They may be asymptomatic. It's a dangerous situation. So to truly love thy neighbor it means have the services in your own home through Zoom or other networking device. We are fortunate in this day and age that we can do that. We have the technology. And even Mike Pence, as religious a guy as it gets, says do not go to these church services on Easter because it's dangerous. It's dangerous for you. It's dangerous for others. Now, the governor specifically exempted large religious gatherings in his emergency order that orders us to stay at home. So I think he did that from a political standpoint, not from a public safety standpoint. I think he did it to play to his evangelical base when in reality, evangelical leaders, religious leaders are almost uniform in telling congregants to stay home and they'll do the services through the computer because they care about their congregants. They're loving thy neighbor. But there are unfortunately some others who are gonna put their neighbors at risk by attending these crowded services. And that is dangerous. I urge people not to do it. It will not be against the law because the governor exempted it from his emergency order. But to me, it shows that you really do care about each other, that we're all in this together, that we're not going to engage in dangerous behaviors that put each other at risk during this very difficult time. Okay, great answer. Okay, so I just want to just stand by real quick. I see that um, I have some people saying hello, hello, Anisha, hello, Pam, hello, Jerry, hello, Kelly. Um, Miss Betty Wells is saying, uh, he, she said, watch the expression on his face when you tell him that Miss Betty Wells is here. Oh, I love Miss Betty Wells. She is a leader in the community. She's full of love and kindness to others. I love getting her text messages. Uh, she's amazing and she just brightens up every room. All right. So you got that, Miss Betty Wells. You got your quick shout out. <laughs> so, Mr. Ehrenberg. All right. So, the next question um, or rumor squasher is <laughs> if, because, you know, I just did an interview yesterday with uh, Sheriff Rick Bradshaw, and he was basically letting everyone know that, you know, the law still is in place regardless of the COVID 19. So, you can go out and commit a crime and think you won't get arrested because you have COVID-19 or because it is a pandemic, laws still apply. So with that being said, um, if you are arrested, you know, are we having increased bonds? Uh, is that something that's a rumor or is that true? It depends on the crime. If you are charged with violating an emergency order, which law enforcement is really good about, they don't want to just go and hassle someone. They're gonna go up to someone who's at a beach when they're not supposed to be or violating a curfew. And they're gonna to talk to that person. Their goal is not to load up the jails with people. Their goal is to get voluntary compliance with these orders. But for some individuals, they're obstinate. They'll keep violating it or they'll encourage others to do so or they'll act defiantly. And then they very well may be charged. And if you're charged with violating an emergency order, it's a second degree misdemeanor, but according to the court's order, not the sheriff, not ours, it's the court's order, you will be held for the night to see a judge the next day without bond. You're not gonna be able to bond out automatically on a bond schedule. Because think about it, if you're supposed to quarantine and you're out there putting everyone at risk, you know, the, the, the cops and the courts, they don't want you then to just bond out and go right back to putting other people at risk. You're going to have to see a judge the next morning. So in that case, that secondary misdemeanor is treated more uh, it, harshly than others because we're in a state of emergency. So if you're charged with violating the emergency order, 
you could either get a notice to appear or the, the police could take you in. And if that happens, you will spend the night in jail and see a judge the next morning. But as far as bonds themselves, the bonds have not been increased. In fact, some bonds have been lowered. We have tried to avert an overcrowding problem at our local jail, and we don't have one, but we're trying to prevent one during the state of emergency by lowering the bonds for certain third degree felonies that don't involve violence, that are non-burglary felonies. So people can get a bond for $1,000 instead of $3,000. And the goal is to reduce the crowding of our jails. So in that sense, the bonds are lowered for certain crimes. And then there is the question of a penalty enhancer, meaning that if you commit a crime like burglary during a state of emergency, if you're taking advantage of the state of emergency to commit your crime, then it's an enhanced penalty where you would get instead of a misdemeanor, it could be a felony. Instead of a third degree felony, it could be a second degree felony. So the charges could be increased in those particular cases. It all depends on the case. Hmm. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Now, I, and I know that there's a terminology for, I know it has a terrorism in it, but I want to speak on that for people who um, know that they have COVID-19. Um, they've been diagnosed with it, a positive result. I know that there was one video that was went viral with the guy saying that he had COVID-19 and he was actually in the store shopping and he didn't have a mask on. And it pretty much was like, I don't care. I got it. You'll get it. We'll live and we'll, we'll go on. If that's proven, um, what can be done um, for those type of people? Katie, I'm glad you asked that question because I wrote an article about this issue that's posted on msnbc.com. I encourage people to Google it. And it's, I wrote it with Dr. Dave Campbell, who's a, a doctor in our community, a surgeon. And we wrote about what happens to people who are carelessly putting others at risk. It's an easier case when someone's intentionally doing it. If someone is out there who has coronavirus and is intentionally trying to spread it, then that's an easy charge. If someone is out there violating a quarantine, relatively a cut and dry case, you're either home or you're not. But what happens in the tougher case, Kitty, where there's gray area like the JetBlue passenger who wasn't informed that he had tested positive for coronavirus until he had already stepped foot on the plane some at some point on the plane, then he was notified. What happens when you take actions that are careless, but you're not told that you have the virus? Is that a criminal act? And I've looked at this closely and I would think the closest statute on the books would be something called culpable negligence, which says that you cannot act recklessly and put others in harm's way. If you apply that to coronavirus, it means that you cannot act recklessly when you either have the virus or you should have known you had the virus. And in so doing, make it likely that other people will get the virus. If that happens, then yes, you can be criminally charged. It's a misdemeanor, but if God forbid someone dies because of it, it could become a secondary felony. Wow, that's serious. Okay. Yeah. So, so the laws are not altogether on point in this area because we're in uncharted territory here. You know, the laws didn't envision coronavirus, COVID-19. And so you have to use other older laws and start to try to apply it to the current situation. But that's what lawyers do all the time. And speaking of, of lawyers, uh, I'm sure that this has affected the court systems. Um, I was actually thinking because every year I am one of those people who seem to just get chosen for jury duty. <laughs> Thank um, you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was, you know, in, in, in my joking way, um, I was saying, wow, well, if I get chosen for jury duty, it probably won't be anytime soon because if anybody has been selected for jury duty, you know, there's no social distancing in there. You are pretty much shoulder to shoulder with random people looking at movies all day. So there's, there's that can't happen. So for people who maybe have gotten um, selected and have a date or court dates that are coming up, you know, are, is everything kind of on ice right now or is the court system still really running? The jury trials have been postponed. So there is no jury duty uh, until further notice. Originally it was supposed to be until mid April then they expanded it uh, so it's no jury trials until further notice. They've extended the uh, the prohibition. And so most of the court activity is not happening because of coronavirus. And it's because of what you said. 
you can't have a 200 member jury pool where people are standing next to each other that violates social distancing. And so what we're left with are certain essential hearings at the courthouse. We're doing domestic violence injunctions. We're doing first appearances. Everyone must see a judge within 24 hours if they've been arrested for a crime and, or, or they're eligible for the bond schedule. We're doing arraignments. So we're doing the essential activities. And that's why I still go to work every day, but, and, and our lawyers are in court 365 days a year, but the jury trials have been uh, postponed for now. Okay, so you won't be in trouble if you, I mean, because you know how you have the little number on there that you need to call. Um, I just don't want people getting in trouble, you know, for not showing up or not calling in or not doing the right things because, you know, we we know now that they have been postponed, but still, I'm sure that you probably still need to call, I guess, and find out the information. But for people who do have court cases, uh, they kind of got some lead way or some time, I guess, if that's the right way to, you know, maybe time helps people, I'm not sure. But they got a little time right now until everything is kind of back to normal. Is that yeah. correct? It doesn't absolve them from jury duty. You're gonna have to do it <laughs> at some point. Sorry, Kitty, but hey, it's your civic duty. I would love to do jury duty. I got called a, a year or two ago and, and they wouldn't let me in the courtroom to do it. They bounced me because it was a criminal case. I thought I could be objective, but <laughs> they, they, uh, the, the court and the attorneys thought otherwise. So um, you'll still have to do it, but it won't be for a little while. Okay, I had a question from um, attorney Brian Boyce. Uh, he used a big word, so I do apologize. Hopefully I don't mess this one up. Um, does the science allow epidemiologists or other experts to establish specific person-to-person -person transfer of CV-19 or is it circumstantial case? Is it a circumstantial case? Wow, that's a heavy duty question. Mm -hmm. We have not seen a case like this. And so when that case comes up, if it ever does, where you're being charged with transmitting the virus to others, then medical experts will be testified because otherwise, remember, if you're dealing with culpable negligence, you have to show someone was reckless in making it likely that the virus would be transmitted to others. Well, how do you prove that unless you have a battle of experts? And that's why you will have experts. I don't know, that's very fancy, that word that he used. I, I, I don't know the specific name of the expert. Well, he's also an attorney, so go figure. You know, you all use big words. I tell people, talk like a fifth grader so the rest of the world can- <laughs> yeah. No, no, Kitty, we don't necessarily use big words. We use Latin words, Latin words, just to confuse people. <laughs> Uh, to make ourselves feel smarter than everyone else, right? Latin oh. words. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if you can add Latin words to the big words like Brian did, now that's really something. <laughs> uh, so we haven't seen the cases yet that Brian's talking about, but if it happens, you will see a battle of experts, I'm confident. Okay, so I know that you are not, um, you know, you don't really handle civil cases, but I wanted to throw this at you. And again, I told you, if you can answer it, you can. Um, a lot of people right now, like I said, we're going back to essential things. Um, everything's expensive. Some people, unfortunately, are losing their jobs and they have to say, well, you know what? I'm gonna either pay public, so I'm gonna pay my rent. My, my kids are home, they're eating up the house. Uh, I don't, I can't do both. So if you are a person that, let's just say, I'm not gonna, pay rent for the next three months and you make that decision you know there i guess landlords can put eviction notices in place do you have any just any knowledge on that or you know any words of wisdom <laughs> that you can give us on that yeah the governor has imposed a moratorium on evictions for 45 days and then you also have the sheriff who appeared on your shows said that mm -hmm. they are not enforcing any eviction orders you need the sheriff to enforce them and they're not my concern is that there'll be individuals who will be thrown out in the streets who won't know of the moratorium, who won't know of the sheriff's policy. He'll just voluntarily leave and be homeless or, or, or go into a shelter where you're right next to each other. So we want people to be able to stay in their own home, self-quarantine and stay at home. And you can't do that when you're evicting people onto the streets. But the governor has imposed a moratorium. The sheriff has said he's not enforcing the eviction orders. So it's that. Now you still have to owe, you still owe your rent. That hasn't changed, but you won't be evicted. That's okay. That answers the question. Thank you. And I think, um, you know, I don't think any, unless anyone else had anything to ask, I think that was the main questions. Um, we talked about the price gouging. We talked about 
the church uh, Sunday. Um, so, you know, to answer that question, if you go, it's kind of like you go at your own risk. That, it, it, does that make sense? Because you said, like I said, the governor has not really imposed anything on um, religious sanctuaries. Kid, I wouldn't even say you go at your own risk. I think okay. when you go to a large religious gathering, you are putting mm -hmm. other people at risk mm -hmm. and yourself because you're allowed to go under the governor's order. You are entitled to go to religious gatherings, no matter how large. But that not only increases the risk to yourself, but to others. And that's why we're all encouraging people to do it from home. You know, uh, you, we can all practice our faith at home. I, I did a Passover Seder via Zoom. And, you know, that's something that I've never done before. But it, it is still uh, a religious experience. And, you know, God would not want us to jeopardize our health, our safety by being in a large group right now. You can do it from the comfort of your own home with a computer. Okay, I have one other question. It says, um, how, by Yashika Bailey, how is Palm Beach County enforcing the stay at home orders? The sheriff's office and the local police agencies for the various cities mm -hmm. have the ability to charge people with violating the state's stay at home order. It's a second degree misdemeanor, punishable up to 60 days in jail. but the law enforcement community have been really reasonable about this in that they're not trying to have to you know, start hassling people and throwing people in jail. They want to work with people. They are trying to communicate the message that we're all in this together. Please stay home. We depend on voluntary compliance. So law enforcement community is doing it right. They go up to people and they will talk to them. And if the person doesn't have a good excuse, they have the right to charge them, but they haven't been. They have been just telling the person to go home. But if that person is a repeat offender, or if that person is someone who's committing another crime, like for example, we've seen a case where someone committed DUI when that person had no reason to be out and about. So that person got a charge for DUI and a violation of the emergency order. We've seen stuff like that happen. Uh, but for the most part, if you're gonna be stopped, the police will try to educate you of the law and will tell you to go home because we don't want to have our jails crowded with individuals who just are ignorant of the law. Uh, but that could change. So right now it's about educating people and that could change later on. So I'm encouraging everyone to voluntarily comply and stay at home. All right. So I, I really thank you. Unless there's um, anything else that you can think of that you may want to say or haven't said, um, I think that completes uh, my questions. I wanted to get, you know, those things out because, you know, when you when you're on social media, you see rumors and you see things and I always am one now to go to the source and about the bonds. You talked about that. I thought they increased. But you, like you said, you know, in some cases they have decreased in some cases they will increase. So we talked about pretty much everything. And I want to just thank you again um, for allowing um, my guests to pick your brain. I know it's not often where people can the public can sit down and talk to you <laughs> and kind of ask questions and hear it from, you know, no pun intended, the horse's mouth. Um, but I, I really just thank you for letting us be, uh, you know, open to the community. Uh, Terrence says, thank you, Kitty, and state, thank you, state attorney, for the clarity. And I think that's mostly what a lot of people need, especially right now, is clarity, because we are just filled with all this information, and it just, it just raises blood pressures and make people more tense than what they need to be. Thank you. You know, this community has really stepped up. I, I see neighbor helping neighbor. I mean, there are some people, obviously, who have been price gouging and hopefully that has stopped. I have heard many fewer complaints about it. Uh, at the beginning, we saw people hoarding essential items like toilet paper. That's why the shelves are bare. But I think that that was an initial shock of something that we hadn't experienced before. I think now we've entered into a phase where we're starting to understand the parameters and the need to start looking after each other. And I think that says a lot about our community. So I appreciate the chance to communicate this to everyone, Kitty, and hopefully we can do this again soon. All right, we will definitely. So I want to thank everyone who was able to join. And again, sharing is power. Um, when you hear things, you know, and we're trying to debunk theories and squash rumors, please make sure you share this video so we can share the correct information in our community. And I will try to keep you, um, and when I say you, meaning the community, as informed as I possibly can. When I hear things, I want to get to the source and I want to make sure that I can have the people like 
Dave Ehrenberg and um, Sheriff Rick Bradshaw on the show because a lot of things are surrounded by law. Can we get in trouble for this? Are we doing this? Is this law in place? So, you know, whatever I can do, I will help you. And I just want to thank, um, you know, them for being open to sit down with me and my followers. But uh, this has been a great show again. And um, we definitely will, I'm sure as this thing changes and evolves, we will definitely have more questions. <laughs> I'm you. happy to answer them, Kitty. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you again and have a great uh, Friday. And again, um, you know, join us weekly. We'll try to give you as much information as I can. And again, this is a community effort. So please, again, make sure you hit the share button. These kind of informative videos, these are the videos that need to go viral because, again, this will bring down some of all this, you know, these rumors and these things that we're hearing across social media. So, again, thank you, everyone. And we're going to end the video now, but I'll talk to you soon, Dave. Thank you, Kitty. Talk to you soon. Have a great one. Bye-bye.